My name is Joe Conway. Um, I am, uh, I've been part of the Postgres community for a lot of years now, committer and on the sysadmin team. I'm also a, a senior uh, software development manager at Amazon. And uh, I lead a team that uh, does Postgres contribution. So what we're here to talk about today is um, things that are problems with handling of collations in Postgres and one solution that, um, that we have developed and open sourced that um, allows you to deal with it. Um, I will call it a hack, but it's, it works. It's, it's out there. It's being used in a significant number of instances for a significant amount of time. If you're interested in kind of what the future should be, because this may not be the future, but this is like how we get by until all of the current versions of Postgres sort of time out. Um, probably Jeff Davis will have an unconference talk, I hope, on Friday to talk about the work that he's done in Postgres 16 and, and hopefully will continue to do in 17 to improve the, uh, the way Postgres handles collations with um, ICU instead of GLibc. I'm sure with help of other people like Thomas Monroe and Peter Eisentraut and, and others. And if you need to get a hold of me, you can use either of these emails. This one is like easy to find on the internet, and Conway at Amazon is my work email. So, like I said, um, this talk is about what is the problem, and I, I know everyone is basically aware that there's a problem. I'm not sure everyone is aware how easy it is to hit the problem, and so I'm going to go through some um, fairly dense slides, like with SQL and code and stuff that illustrates how easy it is to hit this problem. Um, and then talk a little bit about if you do hit it, how do you fix it? And then um, the alternate approach is the, is the thing I alluded to, which is this open source project, uh, which is effectively extracting just the locale functionality out of glibc in a way that is portable so that you can wrap it up in an RPM and distribute it to a from a rel, basically build it on rel seven and have it run on rel nine um, and get, so you get the rel seven glibc collation semantics on your rel nine system so that you don't break your indexes. That's kind of in a nutshell what we're gonna talk about. So let's just dive right into it. Um, if you're on a rel seven machine and you just did an ITDB and you know PG control and you start start your database up and you're on 15.2. I wrote these slides before the last minor release. And you do, you take a look at um, what your database encoding and collations are, you'll see on, on rel seven, glibc is 2.17. So our, our data, that call version is 2.17. And, and if you use this um, actual version function, you can see what the library actually reports. And although this is being reported as a collation version, it's really the glibc version, right? It's literally calling the glibc, get glibc version function or something under the covers. Now, if you do the same thing on rel nine, exactly the same way, um, you'll see that you're on glibc 2.34. And probably everyone is, maybe, I mean, most people are probably aware that the big breaking change in glibc is 2.28, right? 2.28 actually corresponds with rel8. But the fact is, is every major version of glibc changes some sorting somewhere for the most part. So if you're going from pretty much any version of glibc to any other version of glibc, the potential exists for corrupted indexes. And even it is possible, uh, because I've seen this, even in a minor update to glibc with just C code changes and no data changes, there can be some characters that collate differently. So potentially in order to guarantee that you don't break indexes, you have to almost lock down to a specific minor version of glibc. 
I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more later. All right, so this is like, this is the in your face slide, right? Um, what I'm doing here is I'm saying, what, you know, what version of rel am I on? And I'm just selecting these three values, one a, one a, and one a, a, and I'm ordering, right? On rel seven, this is the order I get. On rel nine, this is the order I get. So if you thought, that the glibc issues were related to some strange Unicode character that you're never going to see in your database, you're probably wrong, right? So this, this puts it right out there. The, the way the dash is getting collated changes. All right, so I'm going to go in a little bit more and show you some more things. So if I create a table, very simple table, F1, column is text with a primary key on it. I insert those same three values, and I this is on a RHEL 7 machine, and I select from that column, I see that same order that I saw a minute ago, right? But now, I'm gonna upgrade the OS underneath my database, right, or I, replicate to a rel nine machine or you know a number of other ways I can wind up with the exact same Postgres data directory on a newer machine with a newer glibc right so the first thing you notice is whoops when I select when I initially do that upgrade and I select I still see the same order right it hasn't changed it looks like everything's fine but now I insert into that table with the primary key on it, remember, a duplicate value, and it just works. <laughs> and you, at this point, you still have no idea that there's a problem, right? <laughs> Until someone says, oh, did you know you have to re-index re because you did this OS upgrade, and now you go to re-index, and you get this, I could not create the index, because this key is duplicated, <laughs> all right? So that's, you know, in a nutshell, that's the biggest part of what we're talking about here and why it's a problem. So let's look at that same query that we ran earlier, and now you can see that actual collation version is reporting 234, but the database was built on 217, so it still thinks it's running with 217. Okay, so now that we're in this situation, go ahead. Uh, given the, I, I wasn't aware that this was stuck in working with my address. Given that, is there any reason to create a new one? Good question, I suppose. Anyone in, in the room have thoughts on that? Well, I, I think there's a fair amount of debate about how hard it is. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I'm going to show you some other examples in a few slides of different scenarios that cause problems. But basically, anytime you have any sort of distributed system where, you know, you're taking binary data and moving it to another system, if that's on a different glibc version, you potentially have a problem, right? So if you get into this problem, you're going to have to fix it before you can rebuild that index. 
you know, this is just one way to do it, right? You look at the CTIG, you can see these are my two duplicate rows. You know, I can kind of guess that this one is the newer one that I created, so I just go delete it, right? And then, then I can re-add my primary key, and then I can do a refresh collation version, right? Which will change that notational version to read 234. And now when I select from that, I see the order that I saw originally when I showed you what it would look like on row nine, right? Because now my index is actually not broken. And so again, if we look, now that we've kind of fixed everything, you can see that the, the versions match again. Okay, so this uh, coalition torture test, one of my colleagues at Amazon, Jeremy Schneider, has created a, um, let's see, I'm trying not to depend on the networking here, so I have this stuff pulled up. On GitHub, there's this um, repo, Ardent, Perf, Glibc, Unicode, Sorting. And it, this is, you could spend a lot of time just looking at this, but basically what he's done is he's produced, um, he's used Perl scripts to produce a data file that includes pretty much, I think he claims it to be every Unicode code point for EN, US, UTF-8 or something like that. Um, and then he produces variations on that with other characters to produce strings that are like in the three to five character range or three to six character range. And he's done that based on having lots and lots of experience with collation breakages in the, go away, um, in the field. And so it's kind of an opinionated, I mean, it's, I think it's probably impossible to test every possible sorting of every possible character, right? But he's produced this file with roughly 26 million strings in it that are all like multi-byte strange characters combined with dashes and dots and other things that are known to cause issues. And what he's done actually is he's gone through and he's tested a bunch of OSs um, for different versions of glibc and he's noted like all the differences in collations that he's found, right? So that's interesting in and of itself. He does all that with just sort on the command line and diff and stuff like that. But basically what I did was I took the file that is output um, from that and it, it requires a little massaging to kind of neatly do a copy into Postgres. But basically if you, you know, I wrote a Python script that just double quotes it and, and, um, and uh, escapes all the single quotes, right? So I could just suck that in. And so I create this table called unsorted table and then I copy that formatted file that I got from his repo. Uh, I just do a vacuum freeze on it for the heck of it. And, uh, and then this query here is basically just doing a string ag across all of the strings in the table that are now sorted and then calculating an MD5 on it. And just try and remember this, you know, these last five or so, the 7E130, this is kind of what we're looking for. If any, anything has changed in sort order, that's gonna change, right? Um, the other thing to notice here is that um, this sort takes about, well, it's three minutes on the instance I did this on, on some other instances, some local ones, I think it was taking closer to two minutes. But in a few slides, there's an important point I wanna make about that too. So sorting these 26 million strings using glibc2.17 takes in the two to three minute range, All right? Uh, and I've, I've given you a link, you know, I'll make these slides available wherever the conference does that. Um, uh, there's a link to that formatted Unicode file that I used here on the copy command. So if you wanna play with this, you self later you can download that and play with it although i seem to be having problems with my own personal website right now and since my wife is not an it tech i probably won't get fixed until i get home next week um all right so 
I'm also going to build an index. So I create an index table, um, just selecting from the sorted table, create the index. And you can see I get the same result here. Um, of course, much faster, closer to three seconds, right? <clears throat> so now I'm kind of unnecessarily on rel seven, but just to show you, if if I create this AM check extension and I check uh, both the index on my primary key index on that small table as well as the index I just created on the uh, torture test table, uh, you can see they're you know both clean. So now I do my rel nine upgrade. There's a couple of things to notice here. Again, given what you've already seen, this is probably unsurprising, but my MD5 value changes because my sort order is different. The other interesting thing here is, and this is kind of a side note to this whole thing, notice that, that's 56 minutes. Um, and I'll, I'll explain that more in a slide or two, I think. Um, and, and, but again, now we're on rel nine, and if I sort using the index, I still get the same MD5 hash I got before. Why? Because my index is actually corrupt. It's not following the actual collation order that glibc wants me to follow, but I haven't done any inserts or anything. It, so it still faithfully, faithfully reports that everything's okay. So now when I run um, AmCheck, you'll see both of my indexes report as being corrupt. You know, this item order invariant violated. Um, I'm sure Peter Gagan who's sitting right here could probably spend a lot more time talking about what that actually means, but um, yeah, <laughs> just like it says. All right, so since I have not done any inserts into this table yet, I can basically just re-index the table. And now when I select from that index, I, I get the order that I expect to get. And when I do AM check on it, I get no errors. All right, so is, is there any, any questions on all that before I move on to some a couple other cases that exhibit problems? Ah, uh, yes, I, I've got a link to the actual issue somewhere else. I think it's toward the end of the deck. I might as well go into it since you're asking. No. I'm right. You're talking about the uh, abbreviated keys, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's easy to confuse because it's like it's separate. Right, right. So what, what Peter's talking about is a number of years ago, he implemented a, an optimization where when you, when you have a bunch of items in an index, you can use basically an abbreviated key. You know, basically you can prove, once you can prove that the two values are different, you you know what to do with them essentially, right? So if, with that. Right. So, so, so what Peter's saying is glibc, and I've actually found this thread on the on the internet somewhere. With Peter and Tom Lane actually were involved in this thread with the glibc folks. The, the two fundamental calls we're talking about here are string call, which does sorting of strings, and string X form, which basically puts 
the string into a format that can then be compared using um, just basically uh, it just does an integer comparison. And you can pre-calculate those, which is faster. And so it, it sounds like it should be really nice, except with glibc, they don't agree. The two the sortings you get with those don't agree, even though I think virtually anyone reading about them would, would probably agree that they should agree. But the glibc ba people basically said, eh. Well, they said, yeah, they said it's involved, but they also said, well, we do. Yeah. Uh, there's many reasons about so, so in order to get this optimization that Peter's talking about, you have to use ICU, not glibc. So that's, that's that optimization. The problem that um, I'm talking about, this, this commit to glibc, which was done in, I think it was 2.21. So it, it happened in one of the glibc majors in between rel seven and rel eight, let's say, right? So um, the whole purpose of this was supposedly to improve performance. If you read, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna try and read this to you, but if you read through these got performance tests and all kinds of stuff that say, this is a good thing to do, it removes a cache. Right, and so I, I haven't actually tried to like go really deep and figure out why his tests show that it was an improvement and my tests show that it's not, but I suspect because he tested mostly with like ASCII characters and not a lot of kind of corner case multi-byte characters or something like that, right? So the bottom line is anything in glibc prior to this commit, you get the like two minute time for that 26 million row sort Anything after this commit, you get more like 60 minute time for the sort. So the, the compatibility library that I talk about at the end, one of the kind of side benefits of that is you regain the performance because you can now use the glibc 217 version that doesn't have this performance regression. It's not just regaining performance, getting much better performance. Well, I mean, it's very much based on bit for bit basis, so it's like it's three times faster physically. And that's from, you're talking about separate. Well, but you're, in order to get that performance improvement, you have to go to ICU because yeah. even with this compatibility library, you're still not getting the abbreviated keys. Right, we disabled them because we learned, we found out that it was consistent that way, it didn't compare very much. Right. Okay, so. Here's another example of a problem that you can run into actually with this. You know, as I kind of alluded to earlier, if you've got a distributed system, you potentially have different OSs with different versions of glibc on different nodes, right? Now, you know, the conservative person in me has always been for reasons that I didn't even really consciously think about, hey, I want everything to be exactly the same. But, you know, there's nothing that forces you to make everything the same. So let's say you've got Postgres on a RHEL 9 machine and you create a foreign server to a RHEL 7 machine, right? Maybe because you're in some kind of a transition period before you completely cut over or whatever. Um, so, I, you know, I create the foreign server to this RHEL 7 machine. I map a user and I create a foreign table, right? And I'm the foreign table is that same little test collation table that I was showing you earlier. And I've also got a copy of that table locally on my RHEL 9 machine that was built with the glibc on RHEL 9. So now if I kind of force a merge join, I get this error. And why is that? Because the table on both sides is being sorted differently. The merge join depends on things to sort the same way, right? So you can see this with the remote SQL is, is trying to sort the data on the remote side, which gives you a different sort. And so here's a third example of an issue you can run into. If you create a partition table and you partition by range, right? And here I'm gonna say part one is gonna be from minval to one A. And part two, it's from 1-A to max valve, right? And I think this is not inclusive and this is inclusive, I believe the way this works, right? For partition? Yes, that's what I thought. Um, so now on my RHEL 7 machine, I insert the value 1A, 
And you see that that winds up in the first partition, right? But now when I go to rel nine and I insert the value one A, it's gonna to go to the second partition. Right? So again, this is three fairly simple and fairly common use cases that are completely broken if you try and run across different versions of glibc. So why, why is it important? Because chances are really good that if you're in Postgres 15 or earlier, you are using glibc as your coalition provider. I mean, I'm sure there are people using ICU. It's, it's not the default. Most people end up using the defaults. Um, so this may not apply to you, but I think by and large, the vast majority of the people using Postgres today have this problem. Your sorting relies on the collation. Your indexes persist that sorter. Constraints may depend on order. Partitioning by range depends on that order. Merge join and probably other. I mean, I haven't, I'm sure there are more examples that we could come up with that would be breaking due to this. And then additionally, if you start looking at what the end of life of some of these kind of common operating systems and all right, you've got roughly three years for rel seven but you know the way databases tend to be <laughs> that people who are on rel seven will be pumping up against that date and then they're going to be like what do i do now right um debian 10 and ubuntu you've got a year so this this is a problem that everyone's gonna have to deal with um uh, you know like i said if if you do nothing else, what you're gonna to have to do is sort of upgrade your OS, keep everyone locked out of your database while you re-index everything. Which, if your database is 100 terabytes, that may take a while. Even if it doesn't, it may take a while, right? So you may, you may be down longer than you'd like to be in order to do your OS upgrade, which you might be getting forced to do for security reasons or other reasons, right? So it may not even be in your control as the person responsible for the database that the OS is getting upgraded. You're gonna to have to just deal with it. So without anything else to help you, like I said, definitely don't let anyone touch your database until you rebuild all your indexes. Otherwise, you're gonna to have to follow up and clean up all of this corruption. Any kind of insert or update on a table with an index that's affected by collation is going to be broken. So you're gonna to have to tackle the, the broken indexes. Um, and again, this, this distributed systems thing, I, when I first started getting involved in this, I didn't even really think about those, but this affects more than just Postgres, really. And you think about how many distributed systems are out there these days, you know, that end up sorting data in some way and then merging it together and you know, Hadoop and other things like that. I just don't think there's enough people out there talking about this stuff. Um, but it's, you know, and, and, and like I said, as long as you kind of did the thing that the conservative intuitive, you know, admin would do, which is make everything the same, then you're probably okay. But if someone slipped a different version of something in there at some point into your cluster, it's like, who knows what kind of bad results or corruption you might have. Okay, so now I'm gonna go on to my solution. Um, any questions before I get into that? Yeah. I think these two guys have thought about and talked about some of this, some of that. Uh, 
Yeah, we should, we should probably take it offline. I, I, I mean, the solutions would be welcome. We can maybe come up with one during this conference. Yeah, I, I mean, part of, in my mind, part of the longer term solution is kind of related to the work that Thomas Monroe was doing with the multi-lib stuff where you can kind of have some indexes on one version of ICU and some indexes on another version of ICU so that you can sort of, in a coordinated fashion, kind of migrate from an older one to a newer one. I, I'm not sure you could do that with glibc. Maybe with this compatibility library, if we supported multi-lib for glibc, you could sort of do the same kind of thing. I'm sorry. What? Yeah, you basically have to have two different two different collation libraries loaded simultaneously and have the index use the correct one. But that's this multi-lib stuff that Thomas has submitted some patches and Jeff has played with them. And I don't know who else may have played with them a little bit, but um, I mean, that's still future work. It's not, it's not in 16. Um, maybe it's something that could get into 17. This is clearly a difficult problem. <laughs> so, so anyway, the the solution, which is has been out uh, open sourced now, um, is this um, compact correlation for glibc. Um, the way this works is basically a there's a the real code is in branches. There's a branch for glibc 2.17. There's a branch for Amazon Linux 2, which is glibc. Um, uh, I'm sorry, there's a branch for RHEL 7 glibc, which is 2.17. There's a branch for AL2 glibc, which is 2.26. And so you would check out that branch. And basically, there's um, what the code does is it provides a method so that you can extract just the locale functionality out of glibc. And produce an RPM. And the RPM has no dependencies. It's um, it's built against for all the non-locale related functionality. It's built against libc and ld and those kinds of things. And I'll kind of touch on why that was necessary later. Um, but what it what it allows you to do is then you know you build this 
2.17-326 version of the glibc locale functionality into an RPM. You install it on your RHEL 9 machine, and then as far as and then you build Postgres to use it. And again, I'll talk about that a little bit in a few slides. But once you've done that, as far as Postgres is concerned, collation is coming from a glibc 2.17-326. Well, sort is not a syscall. Sort is is a call into libc. Well, right, and you're not, that has, right, has. I mean, libc is just a shared object library, just like this is. So I, I mean, pro we, we probably should take this offline. There, there are some like micro optimizations that are done by the glibc folks that I had to disable to make this work. All right. Um, glibc is this tangled mess of like 4,000 different functions, right? And they do all kinds of magic under the covers to like skip the, the elf lookups so they go directly to things in a way that's highly optimized. And, and that all works as long as everything that you're accessing is in libc. And again, I'm, I have a slide on it, but there, <laughs> some of it goes all the way down to the hardware. And it also, when you build libc, you get ld.so at the same time. And ld.so, you definitely want to run that off the local system. You don't want all of that functionality built into this thing, right? And it has structs that change from version to version. So if you try and touch the wrong functions in libc from this compatibility library, if you like bring them in, you end up with trying to use structs that are ABI incompatible and things go badly, right? So there's probably some minor performance degradation by using this, but I never tried to measure it and I couldn't notice it. And I, I've tested this on both x86-64 and AR-64. So I've, I've tried this on a Graviton instance on Amazon REL 7, REL 9, AL 2, AL 2023. So far, it all just works. I've run the 217 binaries from an AL 2 system, uh, excuse me, on, from a REL 7 system on an AL 2023 system, and it works. In fact, I even took the, the files and loaded them on my Linux Mint system, which is Ubuntu based, and it worked too. So you can use LD preload um, to use this with Postgres. We don't currently. Um, there may be reasons you want to do that. And if, if you do want to do that, you have to build it in a specific way, which I, I touch on in a couple of slides. So how is this created? Uh, you know, you clone this, um, this repo, uh, check out, like I said, check out one of the, right now there's two branches. Potentially we could create more branches each time you want to create support for a new specific version of glibc, you would need to create a new branch. You would need to take the existing changes to glibc from the other branches and then figure out how to merge them. Which, when I went from AL2026 or from glibc2026 to glibc2.17, I think it took me about a day or so, maybe two days part time, to figure out how to how to merge that so that it would work on 2.17. So it's, you know, it's not like just apply it, but it's pretty straightforward. So are you using the uh, GLibc sources directly or are you? No, I'll talk about that too in a second. Um, the, I'm actually using RPM sources very specifically because, um, well, I might as well show this. Okay, so this is the source. This is the sources directory for a glibc RPM. You, you see that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, these are all patches that get applied by the package builder on top of glibc. So for glibc 2.17, I've 
counted it earlier. I think it's like 900 and something. It's 989 files in there. There's the, there's the glibc 2.17 tarball, and then there's 980 some odd patches, right? So I want this thing to be, you know, we kind of talked about this in the developer meeting yesterday. I want it to be copy exact, right? So if I'm trying to get the same sorting semantics as a RHEL 7 system, I want to start with exactly what I would have on a RHEL 7 system, which is not just glibc 2.17, but glibc 2.17 plus 980 patches, right? So there's a, a build script that um, provide that produces an RPM, if all goes well, and then you can just install that. You can move that to another system and install it there. It builds without dependencies. Like I said, I mean, I, I can't say it's been exhaustively tested on like everything under the sun, but it works going from RHEL 7 to RHEL 8, RHEL 7 to RHEL 9, RHEL 7 to AL 2023, um, Linux Mint at least. Well, I didn't install the RPM, but I did use like CPIO or whatever and un, un extract everything out of the RPM and just use it on my Mint system and it worked. All right, so I, I, you know, obviously I can't dive into all the way into the details. If you're interested in seeing more of the details about how this thing builds, I can do that over the next couple of days, you know, just one-on-one -on -one with people. Um, so, it, you know, like I said, just said, it's it's built on top of the RPM um, source code because of all of those patches, because we want to make sure we're identical. And the changes that were made are kind of in two broad buckets. They're some changes to glibc source and some changes to the package building group. The goal was to minimize those changes. I wanted to be able to reason about when I look at this patch, be reasonably sure I wasn't breaking something, right? Um, the types of changes kind of break down further into four categories. glibc has got a bunch of hard-coded assumptions about paths for various files. And so in order to have an alternate set of files, and by the way, this is written so that you could potentially have multiple versions of this compatibility RPM installed simultaneously, kind of anticipating this whole multi-lib thing. But so each locale data directory ends up with a version tag to the data, the directory name, in order to handle that, you know, basically all those hard-coded paths. They, they get passed in as defines during build of glibc, that has to be, Fixed, and there's a couple of places where there really were hard coded things. Um, the non locale glibc functionality, I wanted to source from the actual libc on the system that I'm running on, not have that imported into this library. And like I said earlier, that's because some of those functions touch things in LD that would break if you then move this to another system. So, in order to maintain Portability, and there are other good reasons. I mean, you want the newer version of glibc, so you get performance enhancements and bug fixes and so on that they have, right? So, um, you know, things like malloc is going to come from the local glibc, not from within this library. <laughs> Another interesting thing about the glibc code, all of the functions that are exported, for the most part, are exported with symbol versions using a map file at build time. So if you're familiar with how that works with GCC, you know, you basically at, at link time, you specify a map file and then for every symbol in, in glibc, it says this is version, you know, two dot whatever. Um, and then when you, when you link something to glibc, it links to that version actually, right? So in order, again, in order to make all this work, um, I had to like, reversion my own, the functions that I'm using as compat call instead of glibc, so they were distinct from glibc. Um, and also because of all of this kind of hidden uh, variable symbol stuff that glibc does to try and force these internal optimized lookups, that was also a problem. And so, but what I found was there are certain 
symbol versions in glibc that in, instead of being defined in the map are defined using directives directly in C code, which again, broke all this. So I had to like kind of if def all that stuff out. There wasn't a lot of it, but there was some. And then minor changes to functionality in that you'll see an example of this in a couple of slides, but the GNU get libc version, instead of outputting 2.17, it now outputs 2.17-326.rh7 or dash rh7 or whatever it is so that it matches the RPM source that I started with. Uh, also, the building code changed a little bit. I had to modify the spec file so it just produces the RPM I want. And um, there's some custom build support. Basically, this build files text um, specifies exactly. One, one thing glibc is really good about is virtually every function call in glibc that you would use has its own C file. So all of the stuff that's getting imported into this library, each one has its own C file. And so, and it, you know, I traced out the dependencies and pulled in just the ones I need. There's like, I don't know, four or 5,000 C files in the glibc source tree. This compatibility library uses like 170 of them, I think it was. So it's a small percentage of the overall glibc, but those are specified in this file. This map file is what symbols need to be exported. And then the, the build script. Um, and again, this is probably, I'm sort of out of time, but the next talk isn't for 15 minutes, right? Uh, let's talk about that offline so I can finish the slides. Um, I forget where I was going with that. Um, sorry, I lost my track of train of thought. Oh, so this is probably the, the hackiest part of the whole thing. Again, I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to duplicate the glibc build as precisely as possible. And so what this does literally is it builds glibc without any changes, captures all of the commands that were used to build it. And then for the files that are in that build files text, it rebuilds those files with some substitutions on the com GCC compile lines to like redefine where some of these paths are and so on and give it a different extension for the object files. And then all of those get built into a library. So when I say it's like it's close to copy exact to what glibc is doing, that's why I did that. So, you know, as I said, it's the standard build with this, it it reversions the symbols with a special version that indicates they're coming from this compatibility library. If you want to use preload, one of the things I discovered pretty quickly is you, you have to have the original glibc symbol versions. Um, if in that build script, if you um, modify this to that and rebuild, it basically will build with the original version map from glibc, which makes it harder to sort of introspect and verify that you're using the correlation library. But at that point, if you preload it, it will get used and it works. Um, and that does have some benefits. So I, I talked a little bit of, you know, about this already. LibC um, accesses LD global structs. These two in, in particular are problems. Um, they had to be, you know, basically I couldn't touch anything that touches those in order for this thing to be portable. Uh, I talked about the uh, performance regression already um, that was found. So, you know, if you're using this older version of um, glibc on a newer system, you're going to get a performance boost out of it. And that's just serendipity. Um, I had lots of problems with C types. C types are like, glibc is complicated enough. C types are like complicated on top of that. Um, it, it turns out that C type init, which is called during startup, sets up some structs in memory that are needed by C types, but they're, they're created thread local. Now, when I was testing with Postgres, Postgres is not multi-threaded. This wasn't a problem. But if you run PG bench, which gets compiled with this, and you run it with dash J, that's multi-threaded. So things broke. Um, so it turns out that um, 
you know, I was using a constructor attribute to run this when the library first gets loaded, but I had to basically add something in to make sure that every time those structs get touched, I check to make sure that the initialization was actually run. And if it wasn't, obviously run it. Um, so C type again, um, you know, again, when I, I link using, um, using libs to Postgres, everything just kind of worked, but then some of the libraries have filters in the make files that filter only specific libraries out of libs, which was then screening out the compatibility library. And so I wound up with things like libpq was not linking to the compatibility library. It was getting its set locale from, um, from glibc. And, and so psql, when you started it up, it, it was linked to both actually. So it would use the, the library, the compatibility library when it did LC all, you know, this basically says, set all my locales to whatever the system is to, you know, environment variable says they should. And then this, which was in lib, in libpq, is just saying, what's my C type locale? Except that was sourcing it from libc, not from the compatibility library. And again, that caused things to break. Um, that's been fixed. And then one more time with C type, um, C type H, which Postgres compiles with, has an extern inline versions for two upper and two lower. And I was doing my testing with dash O zero builds. When you do that, it disables the inlining optimization. And so everything worked fine. And then the production builds use O two. And then suddenly things start breaking whenever upper was getting called or lower. So again, that was um, found and fixed. And so try and go through these quickly. I thought I was going to have like, I thought I was going to end up being really short and here I am long. Um, so if I install the RPM, I change it to a Postgres source directory. Basically, if I compile Postgres with the compatibility library that I'm using in libs and do a make, make install, um, this will work for Postgres. Some of those problems that I found in order to fix them, you actually need a patch against Postgres, which um, again, you can get from my website. Where was it? Oh, there it is. So I, I'm not going to show you all of this, but um, basically it's, you know, a bunch of make files that have to have lib compact coalition added to this shared library link. That makes sure that all of the, all of the binaries that get built by Postgres end up using the compatibility library and not libc for the locale stuff. Oops. And so, you know, again, if it, it looks just like you would expect it to look, you're running on a rel nine system, but you're using the, the rel seven semantics. And this is what the actual call version ends up looking like. So that way you know exactly where it's coming from. And when you run the torture test, you get the right answer and you get, you know, you're back to the kind of normal speed. In fact, I think this is within a second of the other example on rel seven. And our indexes look good. And at the end here, I provided some, um, some scripts, you know, extracted out of what I was using to verify that all this is working at kind of a low level. And you can see that like the symbols, when you build Postgres that are locale related should all be versioned as compact call versus the glibc symbols, which look like this. And then this script, again, if you want to play with this, this script will actually walk through the Postgres tree, find all of the shared object libraries and binary executables and, and look for something that is linking to libc and for, instead of the uh, compatibility library. So that's it. Um, talk about the problem, how to fix it in one way and, and the uh, compatibility library uh, as an alternative to that. And, you know, I guess we might have time for another talk, talk or question or two, or is the next speaker here yet?
the next speaker I'm happy to talk to because he can't make it and then go to you. Oh, okay. Uh, if anyone's got additional questions, um, why don't we take it out into the hall?